I do a lot of videos on RxJS, so naturally I get a lot of comments about how oversimplified RxJS is and that it's just a bit too easy to use. Well, I stumbled upon a way we can add a little more complexity to the simple world of RxJS and observables, and that is state machines. So state machines are a staple of computer science, but I've never really had the need to build one in my day-to-day -day work, which is typically front-end development. For me, state machines in front-end development were mostly just this cool idea that David K. Piano talks about. So although we're going to talk about applying state machines to Angular in this video, it was actually through some game dev stuff that I came to using state machines and xState, which is a library that can help us use state machines with JavaScript. So the cool thing about state machines is that by their nature, they make certain states impossible and certain states should be impossible. For example, I have a player that could be either idle or walking. And if they are walking, they could be walking in any of eight directions, up, down, left, right, or the diagonals. So this is a scenario that is captured accurately by a state machine. Although this is a relatively simple state machine, using xState to achieve this provides some nice properties. It prevents the player from being in impossible states, like walking both left and right, or being both idle and walking to the right. And it allows me to perform certain side effects as the player enters or leaves certain states, like playing or stopping the relevant animation, setting their velocity, and so on. What we are going to focus on, though, is how we can apply xState and state machines into our state management flow with RxJS. We are going to apply this to a typical data fetching and error handling scenario where we can be in states where the data hasn't been loaded yet, the data is currently loading, the data has loaded successfully, or the data loading has errored. So let's see what this would look like. So first we are going to create some types to represent our data and state. So if you watched my previous video on error handling with signals reactively, you might notice that we are implementing the same basic scenario here. So we have our data, which is just an object with a title. We have our state machines context, which is essentially what we would typically think of as the state that we want to define. The terminology is a bit confusing here though, so don't get confused by what the possible states of the state machine are, which in this case will be idle and fetching, and the context of the state machine, which is what we more typically think of as the state. Our context for this state machine will be the value of the data we are loading and any errors, which will just be a string. Then we have the events that the state machine can receive. So this is how we go from one state like idle to another state like fetching. If our machine is in the idle state and we send a fetch event, then it will go into the fetching state. If it is in the fetching state and receives a receive data event, it will go back to the idle state. So now we can create the state machine itself. We use create machine from X state to do that and supply our types. We supply our initial state, which is fetching in this case, and our initial context, which is just the value and error set to undefined. Since our initial state is fetching, the data fetching will occur as soon as this machine is created. If we set the initial state to idle, we could have our machine wait until we manually send it the fetch event before it starts fetching that data. Then we have the most important part here, which is the actual definition of the states themselves, idle and fetching. So let's expand these out. So as you can see, our idle state has its own nested state. So not only can we be in the idle state, when we are in the idle state, we will also either be in the no error or error state. We set our initial nested state here to no error, and we tell the idle state to listen for the fetch event. When it receives that event, the state should change to fetching. The fetching state is similar, but makes use of a few more tricks. In this case, we actually need to trigger a side effect to go fetch the data. So we use this invoke property and pass it our observable that loads the data. This observable will be invoked when this fetching state is activated. We map our response from the observable to an event that our state machine expects. So specifically, I am mapping it to the received data event and pass the loaded data along with it. So you can see further down that we are listening for this receive data event. And when we receive it, we are saying that the state should change back to the idle state and not just the idle state. We are specifically specifying the no error nested state of the idle state, because in this case, the data has loaded successfully. So we don't want to be fetching anymore. And we want to show that we have had no errors. 
On top of that, since we have our data, when this event is received, we also perform an action. We use assign to take the data returned and assign it to the value property in our context. If our observable were to error, it would trigger this on error listener instead. In that case, we change the state to idle.error and instead we update the error property in our context to whatever error was returned. So with the state machine defined, we can visualize our state machine using xstates visualizer. So this allows you to simulate events and see how the state changes as a result. Our data fetching state machine is a relatively simple one, but we could also look at the slightly more complex state machine from the xState docs that also covers retrying. So that defines our state machine, but to actually use it, we need to interpret it and call start. So at this point, we can send events to our state machine if we need to, but in our case, fetching starts automatically since we set fetching as the initial state. Now we can easily stream values from our state machine just by using the from creation operator from RxJS. And then just like in the previous signals example, we can convert that to a signal. So I'm specifically pulling out the context information from the state machine here, which will give us those value and error values that we are interested in. Then again, just as with the previous signals example, we can utilize that signal in the template to display our loading success or failure templates appropriately. So there we have it, a state machine, RxJS and signals working together in an elaborate dance of over engineering, I hear you say. So why even use state machines here in the first place? To me, the big benefit here is the strictness of how state can change. Typically with state management, we sort of just set state to be whatever we want in response to events. With a state machine, we get extra guarantees around exactly how state can change and what should happen when it does. In that way, it's a lot like using TypeScript instead of plain JavaScript. You don't need to use TypeScript, but it does provide extra guarantees and tends to reduce bugs. So whether a state machine is worth it or not is up for debate. Uh, I'll definitely be using xState for more game dev stuff. Uh, for my Angular work, I'm undecided at this point. So uh, I'll throw it over to you. What do you think? All right, that's it for this one. Uh, if you found this interesting at all, please consider changing the state of this video to liked or subscribed. And I hope to see you here for the next video.